Anatoly Malakin versus Rug Rug. All right. Two mountains. Mountains. Huge people. Massive people. Um, yeah. Going into this, I was like, all right, Malakin probably is going to be able to fend off the wrestling of Rug Rug, and he will crack him with his hands. And early on in the fight, the first round, Rug Rug really put that to the test. And he sat Malakin down with some takedowns. He picked him up. He slammed him. Malakin grabs the ropes with the elbow. Yep. And Genevieve says, who boy, I have opinions and they are not good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Malakin gets a yellow. Or, yeah. Malakin gets a yellow card uh, for, he grabbed the rope like three or four times in the first round, the first round. Um, he gets the yellow card and you're like, Oh fuck. That's not good for the judging. If you're Malakin, if this fight goes to decision, that's not good. Then. Malkin's like, I will start wrestling. And he uses his pressure to corral Rug Rug into the corner. And really for the rest of this fight, it was kind of Malakin pressing him against the cage or the corner like this. And then yeah. they'd separate and Malakin would go, bop, 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 bop. Except it wasn't like that. It was like fucking moving. Thud, 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 thud. Yeah. Yeah. And punching across his own body. And, and Rug Rug was taking him. And then he'd counter with like a weird shot. And, uh, I, yeah, I mean, he just kept backing up into the corner and Malakin would just walk him there and then start trading these massive, I mean, look how leaned over he is to land a shot and credit to rug rug. He was taking some massive shots. He was taking massive shots. Um, in the and, corner too, where he's like, just the worst place to take shots. Like it, yeah. it looks so bad in the judge's eyes to have you just sitting in the corner, like kind of held up by the ring, just taking yeah. these massive, massive blows. Exactly. And throughout the first couple rounds, I think it's like rounds two and three, he was grabbing the gloves a lot of Malikin. That's a big talking point, obviously, because Herb Dean gave him a the standard Herb Dean hard warning about the glove grab. <laughs> and then the next round he did it again and he gave him another hard warning. And you're like, at that point, yellow cards. The first are one seems pulled. soft. Yeah, the first one seems soft. You've already pulled a yellow card for three glo- for three rope grabs. Are we not going to... Yeah, and where was the yellow card for Rug Rug? Yeah, I don't know. I think a, a yellow card for Rug Rug was justified on the glove grabs because he got such a hard warning and then did it again after Did it that. again. Yeah, so what's the point of the hard warning, right? Um, and then uh, a shout-out, uh, Afia Kamal. Rug Rug is the king of Africa. Um, yeah. And uh, and to uh, Jack Slack uh, timestamps, I took this opinion from Jack Slack podcast. I think it's great. Rug Rug won since it brings MMA to other regions and we get to see new styles of MMA. I agree 100%. Yeah, Rug Rug is the king of Africa. He called, he called out Francis Ngannou already. But yeah, I did. I actually did listen to uh, that part of the Jack Slack podcast uh, today. And I mean, look at that shot. Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> and it is good because you see people win belts and their country gets behind them and kids get behind them and see someone from, cause if you're, if you live somewhere where there's not a lot of examples of someone getting that type of success out in the world, it's hard to think that it's even possible. You know what I mean? Yep. So when you see a guy like rug rug and the push that one has done with him on social media and things like that, then he gets the belt. It's like, Oh shit. Now all of a sudden Senegalese wrestling is like viable option. Right. Uh, I mean, he beat fucking Buchecha with it. Um, so, yeah, it is good. I think it is good for the sport. Um, Joe says this was awful. I, t- I tuned out after two. The yellow card was funny, though. Yeah, and I do think there should have been probably uh, uh, a yellow card for Rug Rug. Um, ultimately, I think the deciding factor was the yellow card for Malikin in the first round. And then in the fifth round, I believe it was the fifth round, Rug Rug caught him with just a stiff right hand while he was in, backed up in the corner. And he sat him down for a second. And they said it was a slip. Rewatching it, I don't think that was a slip. That was a flash knockdown. And if you got yellow carded and dropped in a fight that even though I think he was winning everything in the middle between those two two moments, um, those are gonna weigh heavy. Those are gonna weigh heavy on uh, on a fight where they're scored as a whole rather than round by round. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's not like a 10-8 round in the first because of the yellow card, and then okay, I gotta build back up. No, it affects the whole fight. You know what I mean? Um so yeah, I, I understand why Rug Rug got the win here. I'm happy for him. I like I like Rug Rug. I've always liked Rug Rug. I got to see him. Uh, who do you fight in the Philippines when I saw? Him? I was there. 
Uh, I don't remember, but I've always liked them. Uh, Synchro says, opinion on the ring versus the cage. Okay. Obviously, the ring is great for Muay Thai and kickboxing. Yeah. Uh, for MMA, I'm not a huge fan. Undesirable, of, to put it lightly. Yeah, not not ideal. Um, I get it. You can see more, right? Uh, it looks cool. It's all white with the black crowd in the background. It looks fucking cool. Uh, it actually, Visually, it looks really cool, in my opinion. Um, grapplers in the ring... Not a fan because if you get someone in a submission, you can kind of just like lean out and they're like, oh, I got to reset. And like, good luck resetting a submission attempt. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, also, wrestling, said, like, you, you're, not, you're, there's a whole, like, there's a whole aspect of wrestling where like you press up, press up, get the cage, and then you're using your cage work where mm-hmm. like you're essentially just the same way you're, you're grappling, you kind of lean out. Like, you, you're losing on, on a takedown. You just pop your head out the, the off the ropes, and now we have to reset. Yeah, no, it's it's a gen like it's actually like a real issue with the ropes. Um, there is some nostalgia, like you can see that they got the pride glove right there. Obviously, pride was fucking sick. Most of it was in the ropes. I don't really need to see guys get taken down through ropes though. In the in this fight yeah. in the first round, Malkin almost went straight through, and it's like I don't really need that. Especially heavyweight MMA probably should not be in the ropes. Um, also, if the ropes were there, Malik, Malik might have not lost because he might have not gotten carded because he wouldn't have had anything to grab onto. <laughs> yeah, true. Ghost says, hot take. I think the karate combat pit might be the best thing for grappling like CJI. For grappling, 100%. Yeah, I'm a huge that fan. was really cool. CJI was fucking awesome, huh? Yeah, that entire event was sick. It was so good, dude. That Tackett uh, Cade fight was fucking awesome, dude. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the entertainment value of Luke Rockhold was very high in that one yeah i try not to shit talk Luke Rockle too much because he's local but i i'm I'm not even talking shit i completely like i had so much fun watching that entire grappling match no matter what happened regardless (laughs) of the result that was fun as shit to watch it was yeah him trying to tag mighty mouse in his fucking that was so sick uh but yeah so yeah uh i think the pit is very good for grappling i think it's really cool craig jones got the flying uh triangle on who do you get that on roosevelt roberts who do you get that on somebody look it up. Uh, he also ripped his pants off into his underwear that was sick that was pretty cool yeah that was pretty cool he also beat gabby garcia uh but so, so yeah the pit is good but yeah rug rug getting the belt obviously huge massive uh they can do a rematch that we'll talk about later uh i would imagine maybe they'll do a buchet rematch if they can do it um Buchecha, I'd imagine uh, that'll be what they push for, because they they also want Buchecha so much. They want they want him to be super popular. Yeah, the issue is Buchecha just fought out his contract. So, do they roll up the truck for him to fight for the belt, or does he try to pursue other options? With what RDR just said, that might be, you know, way yeah. heavy in his mind. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, shout out Rugrug. I like the guy. He's a fun dude. I think he's he seems like a really nice guy. Uh, he does cheat a decent amount in his fights. Even the Bajaja yeah. fight, he was grabbing shorts like crazy. Herb Dean, Herb Dean was like about to throw hand that fight, dude. The Bajaja fight when he was <laughs> trying to stop him from cheating so much. But you would I, think with how much experience Herb Dean has with him, Herb Dean would be able to figure it out in the second or third time he has to ref him. Yeah, right. But it is what it is. Uh, this fight was not the best. Uh, if we're putting that lightly, it was not a very good fight. I don't know. Maybe they do a rematch if Buchecha goes elsewhere. They got my boy Ben Tynan waiting in the wings for a fight. Uh, but we can move on. Uh, I'm sad for Malikin. I like Malikin a lot. He's a cool guy. Uh, I got to go in the locker room one time before his fight with RDR. I like when we saw him and when he beat RDR the first time, that was in the morning, right? Because it was for prime time in the US, but it was in the Philippines. So it was like 9 a.m. He beats RDR, gets the belt. And then he, there's like five hours in between that. And like, I think it was one, 164 was the card for like the Asian time zone. So it was later that night, same day. Uh, and he's got Tagir Kalila fighting on that card. And we're there for the second event at night. And Malikin just walks out. He's got his belt and he's just walking around the crowd, just sitting down in the random seats in the crowd, taking photos <laughs> of people. Just like, I'm like, dude, this guy's so fucking cool. He's so Seems cool. like the happiest guy all the time. Yeah, both these guys are men of the people, you know. Both of them are people's champs. 
Um, so yeah, I like both of them. I wish this fight was a little bit better. Very sloppy. Uh, if it was in the cage, it might have been a little different, but um, that's it. We could go ahead and move on to another controversial one. Um, Rod Tang versus Jacob Smith 2. It was the second time they fought. Jacob Smith coming off of a loss, getting the title shot against Rod Tang. Rod Tang then misses weight by half a pound. So Wasn't it him. hydration, though? I thought he made was hydration, and then he missed by half a okay. pound. Okay. Okay, so what? But it was the second, whatever the second attempt was. Correct. Yeah, so okay. he failed the first attempt and then came back half a pound over, but on hydration. Uh, yeah, hard to follow. All I know is he got stripped, and then uh, Jacob Smith can win the belt. Rod Tank cannot, obviously. Um, so the fight proceeds, and man, Rod Tank, he's so entertaining, but I think sometimes he is trying to entertain a little too much. And I, I was interested in this fight because <laughs> Genevieve says Rod Tang, king of smooches. Bro, he I was, was kissing more, everybody. Yeah, I, I got, this might sound weird, but I got more into this um, fight. It was more interesting to me once he missed weight than it was before. Because before I was like, I like Jacob Smith. I think he's a decent fighter. Uh, he had a real tough fight before this. Uh, I like him. He's fun to watch. I don't necessarily think he deserved or earned this title shot. I'm not saying I don't think he could have won this fight, but I'm thinking, you know, that the timing wasn't right. Rod yeah. Tang misses weight. Now I'm more interested because I want to see Rod Tang get serious about this and prove a point like, hey, that's on me. I'm here to fucking make a statement. And it was more, he just, it didn't seem like he was taking it very seriously in there. This up, This upward elbow was fucking awesome that split the guard. Um, and that cut him open, but most of the fight was Jacob Smith not quite getting through the guard. Rod Tank does a great job of framing. One of the things that Rod Tank does is he frames a lot up high, and it's similar, it's different, right? Because it's defensive more so than offensive. But uh, DC would always frame super like a lot, the mummy guard, right? Where because he's so much yeah. shorter than everybody, he's walking people down, his hands are tying them up on their shoulders, and then he can land his punches over the top. Stipe obviously is the fucking classic. Oh, the best adjustment ever where Stipe starts going to the body because his arms are up. Yeah. Rod Tang frames very well up high. And in this fight, he framed very well down below as well. And he was blocking body shots better than most that I've seen in his previous fights. Um, that being said, most of this fight was him kind of landing shots, being a little weird and then being like, sorry, sorry, I, I respect you so much. He kissed Olivier Cost. I think he kicked. Yeah. There was a point they had him up against the ropes, and Jacob Smith hit him with a cracked him with an elbow. And then Rod Tang's like, "Are you gonna elbow me?" He's like, "How about I just fucking headbutt your elbow then?" And then Olivier's like, "What the fuck are you doing? You can't do that." And he separates him. He's warning him, and he's like, "I'm so sorry." And he grabs Olivier and he kisses him on the cheek. <laughs> and you're like, "What's <laughs> happening in this fight, dude?" <laughs> it's just crazy. Could you imagine if you just DQ'd him for touching the ref right there? That would have been such a crazy way to end the night. <laughs> Oh my god, dude! Yeah, uh, I saw Olivier posted. He's like, "I've been leg locked, I've been kicked in the chest, I've been punched, I've now been kissed in face." <laughs> <laughs> Shout out Olivier. Uh, Jenny says, "Too much showboating for sure." I usually like how he plays around with his opponents, but this was too much. Like he wasn't taking yeah. anything seriously. Yeah, it's uh, the showboating's great when he's in a fight where someone cracks him and then he starts showboating. And you're like, "Damn, this yeah. is a savage." Uh, and then they get. It, uh, to, go ahead. It felt more like he was trying. He was like like showing that he didn't care rather than like showing that it didn't hurt him. Cause like yeah. all his like other stuff is like, Oh, I'm brushing it off. What you did didn't affect me. And this was more like, I, I, I can beat you when I don't even care if I'm in here. Yeah, exactly. Different type of, of cockiness. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they get to carry in there after the fight, that fight's already agreed upon. That's going to happen. Uh, they didn't show this on the broadcast though. They showed Takeru back with Kana back ringside and stuff. And they're like, okay, they're going to get him in there, right? Obviously, because they got Rod Tang in for Takeru's last fight. And then they did it. And I was like, what the hell happened there? Are they not going to do that fight? And then they did it. They just didn't show it on TV, uh, which is kind of weird. Um, maybe they were afraid maybe like Rod Tang was like in a wrong headspace and might do something silly. Maybe. But yeah, but yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and I've actually criticized it was live, right? these faces. 
It was live, yeah. Yeah. But I, I've criticized them for doing these face-offs in the ring after the fights because I feel like it's kind of disrespectful to the fighter who just lost. And then it's a little too WWE for me because uh, a lot of times they're like trying to, they're going to do like a scuffle and they're going to try to sell like they hate each other. Rotang and Takeru have been very respectful, so I'm fine with it. I like it when it's like, these guys are going to fight. Let's get you guys excited about the fight because these guys are so good, not because of this fake beef and all this stuff. So there that is. Ghost says, whenever I talk about Rotang, I am always disappointed that Super Lake versus Rotang wasn't five rounds. Yes. Yes. It's like the match versus Takeru. What the hell, dude? Takeru versus uh, Tension. So I think it was only three rounds, right? I remember being disappointed. Uh, well, it was awesome. I wasn't disappointed in the fight, but I remember being like, why couldn't I get more of that? Um, so yeah, hopefully they do. Yeah. <laughs> <Well, laughs> what? Um, what? versus Takeru hopefully is five rounds. There's not going to be a belt on the line, I don't think, but please just make it five rounds. Um, so yeah, that was that fight. Rotang will be fighting to Keru hopefully soon. Hopefully they're, I'm assuming they're going to go back to Japan for that. Uh, it, they got it. Rotang would have to fight for the belt again, right? He doesn't just get it awarded back to him, correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah. He's going to fight somebody. I don't know if that's next. Well, it's not next. To Keru's next. I'm sure they're doing that in kickboxing, not in Muay Thai. Um, yeah. Rotang. Who, who knows? Maybe they convince to Keru to jump over to the other sport, give him a title shot, and then when he loses, he jumps back and fights kickboxing. I mean, to carry in Boy Tiger in the four ounce gloves would be fucking sick. Yeah. Um, but yes. Uh, Ryan says, why does Chachi hate Japanese fighters? <laughs> Here's what I think. So, this is my theory on this. And I'm not saying this is 100% right. Um, when he said the big comment that, that spurred a lot of a drama, right, was when he said, uh, who was it? Was it, was it when Takeru came over and lost his super leg? I think it was when he said all of these top Japanese fighters, they come over to one and fight these ties and they get destroyed. And everyone's like, what the fuck, dude? You just signed a big guy. Don't say that. You're putting them all down. I think if I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt, which I normally like to do for people, uh, I think he was You're trying to time. almost, I think he was trying to light, light a fire under Japanese fighters and be like, prove me wrong. And since then, they've signed a ton. A lot of them have come over. Yuki Yoza was talking about leaving and potentially coming over. I don't think he is now because another fight just got hinted at for him. But uh, Masaki uh, Noidi, Kana, like there's other Japanese fighters, top Japanese fighters who have been coming over to one since then. And I think part of it was like a come prove me wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, it so could have been his, uh, it could have been his, uh, do you want to be a fighter moment from, yeah from dana's uh, ultimate fighter yeah exactly um i'm I'm, obviously i can't speak for him (laughs) yeah we got the cat the cat can uh but we can move on uh we had uh jackie buntan versus anisa mexen um yeah inaugural title uh new division new belt for this fight uh this is a big deal right because uh mexen is fucking World class. Jackie, yep. I think, is fucking severely underrated as far as like global recognition goes. Um, has always been a fucking killer. Um, and a very cool matchup. This is like a volume versus like power type matchup a little bit. Um, and it went the distance. Nobody really ever got hurt in this fight, um, but it was still very fun to watch. Yeah, if you I, want I to see punches thrown a hundred miles an hour, that th- this got it. Like they're, they're yeah. they were punching so quick, it was crazy to watch. Yeah, Dragon Ball Z type combos, right? Where it's just like yeah. Uh, Jenny says another bad slash weird fight. I was expecting so much more out of both of them. Yeah, it seemed like it never quite got out of get. Like I said, nobody got hurt in this fight. There was no like big moments of the fight. I mean, the biggest, uh, the biggest moment of this fight was like the illegal knee that Mexen landed in the clinch, right? Cause they're kickboxing. Uh, but Mexen did a great job of just tapping her with the body kicks, with leg kicks. The step in knee was nice. Can't grab a knee, but she steps in and knees. Uh, but, and Jackie did a great job of walking her down, landing bigger shots, big hooks. Um, Synchro says, I'm an old fan of phantom punch breakdowns. We know how good Jackie is. Yeah. Ghost has done some great work on, uh, on Jackie. Check out his sub stack. Um, but yeah, this fight was 
it kind of stayed at the same level all the way through. There was no big spikes, no big lulls. So like coming out of it, you're like, damn, I kind of, dude, I wish it kind of got into a, another gear there and it didn't. Um, that being said, some very good work from uh, Jackie in this fight. Mexen almost made the adjustments of going back to like straight punches. She started landing her jab as the fight came on and it was beating Jackie to the punch and stopping her in her tracks a little bit. Um, Ghost says, I think the word is this fight didn't get out of first gear. Exactly, right? They never hit that second gear. Um, yeah. And, uh, but I still enjoyed it. It was still I a enjoyed fun, technical it. fight. I enjoyed it more than I enjoyed the uh, the girls fight in the UFC. The Robertson one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I would have rather watched this. If you put them on two screens, I would be watching this one as opposed to the Robertson fight. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, probably same. This one did not have a 12 6 elbow to the uh the cooter. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's better, maybe that's worse. Who knows? Depends on who you ask. Uh but ha- I'm happy for, yeah, I'm happy for Jackie. She gets a belt. I don't know what's next for Mexican, except I do actually, because I just remember they double booked her and she's fighting Kana next month. Um, so that, that's also a good fight. Yep. Mexican is um, one of those names where like even if you're not like super into like, you know, the lore or like whatever of uh of certain striking uh martial arts you still like have heard the name regardless yeah. sort of like yeah. Pushesha or, or like gracie or anything like that yeah and uh chummy boy says mexican looked way off man the rust really get to her yeah i don't know because like the last fight what was the last fight pachija was it the last one yeah i think so uh yes um that one it looked like she was she was out of step this fight she didn't look like she was out of step. It seems like maybe she thought it's a close fight, right? So maybe she just thought she was winning and she's like, stay the course. This is all I got to do. Just keep doing this. If I can pitch this all night, I got this. And sometimes it's hard, right? Blood Rope says, I think this illustrates again my personal view uh, that one is at its worst when it is focused too hard on titles and divisions. Uh, lost where I was. Put good fights on and I'll watch if there's a belt or not. Yeah, the constant yeah. double champ, this champ versus this champ, that type of stuff. Doesn't really weigh anything to me. I don't, I don't really get excited about that. It's just the match yeah. itself. Give me the Championships are, are for people who are like going in and out of the sport. That way they know, like, oh, I should be watching this person or that person. But like, mm. good fights are good fights. If you put on good fights top to bottom, the card's going to be good no matter what. You can have no title fights on it. It's still going to have a good fight. Yeah, I could care less if there's no belt on the line for a card. Yeah. Uh, Ghost says Anissa's game is not that layered. She's good enough to counter people hard, uh, but it's just north south movement. Yeah. Yeah. And it's for a long time, it really worked. And I would imagine it's hard to get another layer added when it works for so long, you know? Um, but, you know. And uh, Blunder Rope says Friday Fights is the distilled essence of what makes one good for me. Yeah. Friday Fights is fucking crazy. It's fucking crazy. Uh, it's yeah, what Dana Anissa, West Contender Series what, wishes it could be. Yeah, well, it wasn't really. It used to be just like a subdivision of one or like a second thing that they did. Or it was really a third thing that they did. And then now it's like, oh, you get a contract if you perform in that a number of times and you do well and stuff. And I think they kind of shifted it to be more like the Contender Series. And they took something that was already good and made it like the Contender Series instead of trying to make something into that Yeah, uh, from scratch. Um. Yes. Uh, Ghost says, clearly Anissa is good since she beat Van Sos back in the day. Yeah, damn. Uh, but just not an entertaining or interesting style for me. Yeah, I can see that. And she really doesn't commit to her shot. To the shot, her combo is lacking really compared to how she normally fights. She overwhelmed them with volume. Yeah. Yeah, she she didn't throw quite as much. She tried, I think, at the beginning, and then every once in a while, she she'd kind of – land some pitter patter like a bit like a decent amount of strikes and then jackie would crack her once and you're like fuck it's hard to keep doing that when you're getting hit hard um and jackie hits hard uh but we could go ahead and move on we're gonna skip for the time for time we're already an hour and 10 minutes in um that's longer than we normally go uh sorry rich in the background he's probably sleepy because he's in the time zone ahead of us um Sucks to suck. <laughs> we'll move quick rich i promise uh adriano Moraes, we're skipping he did a great job the guillotine against King Gat, that was actually an awesome fight. Really cool fight. Kong Torney versus Tahir Kalilov, not good. Um, <laughs> skip that Don't, as watch well. that Don't watch that fight. Uh, very good technique from uh, Kong Torney and actually things you could learn from if you do want to watch that fight and learn 
about attacking someone from the open side and how to uh, an open stamps fight should work if you game plan for it correctly. Very good job from Conkatorn in that regard. Not super entertaining, uh, but he got the win. Uh, so it works. Uh, but we will move on to Cade Rotolo versus Ahmed Mujtaba. Uh, what a fight. This, this is Cade Rotolo's second MMA fight. Obviously, he's a grappling champ for one. Um, Mujtaba, the only fight I'd seen him in, I, did, I was going to go back and try to find more fights of his, and I didn't. But uh, he fought K, uh, Sage in Denver last year, and he got heel hooked, I think. Something like that. Um, and I was like, oh, shit, so he's got submissions. And then we never saw him again. Um, but then Cade, obviously, he's a jujitsu jiu- guy. And you're like, all right, Sage subbed him. Cade should be able to sub him. But then you're like, it doesn't always work that way. And they start the fight, and Cade is throwing kicks. And I'm like, yes, that is like the new kind of like grappler meta. Uh, you see a lot of the Dagestani guys doing that now where they're on the outside, and they're just throwing kicks like crazy. Because you don't have to get worried about getting caught and taken down because like that's where i want to be anyways so they're just throwing kicks from the outside and Cade's doing that very well um and i'm like please don't start throwing like crazy boxing combinations thinking that you're like ready for that because you're just, Ronda Rousey. just keep, yeah exactly just keep kicking and if they get close take them down um uh, Blunderbub says, Will, guys like Cade do great staying outside throwing kicks. Cade, overhand skull crack. Exactly. <laughs> and shout out HLB Comer. He's uh, like, hold this right hand. Picture. Says, what day is it? What is happening? Yeah, we couldn't do it yesterday, so we bumped it to this day. And then Ramiro couldn't do it today either, all of a sudden. So we're like, damn, we got Tosi. Because Tosi's the guy. Um, Tosi's the guy you call when you need anything. Um, but yeah, Cade. The Donald Cerrone, as you, one would say. Yeah, yeah, the Jim Miller. Um, Kay's doing a great job kicking from the outside. And then, like Blunderbuff says, <laughs> he's like, I'm in kicking range, but I'm just going to throw this huge overhand right from kicking range. He just covers completely so much sideways, distance. too. Yeah. Like, his covers- arm is just facing the opposite direction. Just, nah, this is how I'm going to punch. Yeah, there's absolutely no reason why this should have landed, but it landed clean, and it dropped Mushtaba. And he jumps on him, and he's like, bop, 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 trying to finish him with punches. Mustafa tries to get back up, and he's like, this is where I'm in my element. And he sinks in that darse. And, uh, yeah, he chokes him out with the darse, gets the finish. Um, easy, easy, picture, one, two, three, easy. There's a picture of him uh, in that ground and pound position here. And the picture, uh, the, the, what's great about this photo is Kate is not normally in a position like this. He's normally in jujitsu, right? He's not in positions yeah. where he hurt, just hurt a guy and he's standing over them on the ground and punching them in the face. And his face looks like it's something that he's wanted to do his entire life. <laughs> he looks like he's putting everything into this. He's uh, 100% imagining this guy is his brother. Like, you stole 100%. the last chocolate milk for the last damn time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Ty's like, fuck. Uh, Blunderbub, uh, shout out Blunderbub. Thank you for joining us. Have fun at work. Uh, also, shout out uh, Lucas Lejour, uh is the judge. He was judging this fight. That's him there in the glasses. Uh, also looks terrified. I'm sure that's the same face that Ty was making when he was like, oh no, I might not be able to beat my brother up anymore. Um, but yeah, he sinks in the darts because like, obviously they're known for the darts. Um, Mushtaba was grabbing the rope, trying to pull himself into it to try to like get some space. And then he's like... Nope, and he leaves the rope to tap. So he gets a submission. And uh, Ghost has a great strat for Cade, and Ty is just a kick because people don't want to take him down, so kicks are free. Exactly. Uh, and Chester, I mean, look at that. But Dars is nasty, dude. What a great shot. So too. far in there. What a cool picture. Uh, Chester, shout out Chester. for join- Thanks for joining. I'm genuinely excited for Cade's future in MMA. I think it could be fun. Yeah, I mean, I think he's only going to get better. I, w- I was saying on the the we did a fight companion for this card on Friday, and I was saying, look, it, the punch worked, it landed, it dropped him, great, that's awesome. But don't do that, that ever again. <laughs> well, not just that, but it, I don't. It's hard to fine tune things if you're constantly winning and everything you're doing is yeah. working. Why do I need yeah. to address certain things, right? I don't think Kate is that guy. He's his whole life. He's been good at jujitsu and he's still fine tuned it over and over and over and over again. Clearly he just won CJI. Right. And I don't think he's going to be that guy who's like, I'm Bangkok ready. I don't need to take people down. I don't need to submit them. I'm going to fucking, I drop people with my hand. Did you not see? Right. I don't think he's going to be that guy. I'll take on Floyd. 
Yeah, exactly. I just hope he doesn't become that guy because it's easy to fall in love with the hands when you start drawing yeah. people. <laughs> Once you feel that, you're like, I like that a lot more uh, than a grueling grappling match. Uh, but yeah, shout out to Cade. Uh, very bright excited future. to see. Very bright future. I think he's so talented. Um, he says he's going to take the year off. That makes sense. I would imagine we see him. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I imagine we see him. This is still a good step up from his last fight, right? This is this only his second MMA fight. I think he's going to make a big jump the next time. I just hope it's not too big. Assuming uh, that he has opponents to fight, like he again, sort of reoccurring theme throughout the the episode is like whether or not one has the the roster to give him somebody an intermediate jump right as opposed step. to. Yeah, as opposed to giving him just the next person in line, which just so happens to be probably a little bit outside of his wheelhouse. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and Ghost says, uh, Cade's game will be more similar to his old coach, Josh Hing- Hinger? Hinger? I've never actually heard it out loud. Um, uh, Zhang Weili's current BJJ coach. Uh, it's a lot uh, It's a lot of half guards, uh, top and front headlock stuff, not just insane guard passing. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, the, the half guard top is so good for, for Darces, right? We saw that with um, one of the coolest coolest back and forth switching is uh, late, recently was uh, Drickus versus Robert Whitaker when he has him in that half guard. And he's like, bam, elbow, elbow, elbow. And then Rob's like, I got to get the fuck out of here. And he shoots <laughs> the underhook, tries to get up, and Cade's – or not Cade. Uh, Drickus is like, great, here's the Dars. And he goes for the Dars choke. He defends the Dars. Back to the elbows. Oh shit! I have to defend these. Back on the dogs. It was very cool, uh, and that's that's a great call from from Ghost because um, his Dars is so good. If he can just get that half guard and and play that half guard Dars game, very cool. Uh, and shout out Omar. The most impressive thing is dude is twenty one. Endless potential. One hundred percent. Yeah. Hope he does. Oh, we said this. We said the same thing about John Jones, and it's like he may have endless potential, but like his ceiling is or his his floor is just as low as the ceiling in regards to like what could also go wrong. True, yeah, true. Uh, but yeah, Omar says hope he doesn't get locked up in one's dungeon and fights once a year. I think they'll make, they'll keep Kate happy. He's Kate is very good for for one. Um, also, they got to keep both of them happy. Yeah. Yeah. James says, uh, repost general question. What's your opinion of people who call someone an uncrowned champion? Is it disrespectful to the current champ or are you indifferent towards that idea? Depends who the champ is. Yeah. I think it depends on who the champ is. I think it's inherently slightly disrespectful, right? Um, Mm -hmm. like inherently, but sometimes that's okay. Sometimes disrespect is warranted. Um, disrespect isn't against the law. Yeah, and I think there's levels to disrespect. When there's an uncrowned champ, I mean, it is a little disrespectful. Like, if you look back at, like, when Bisping was the champ, and then there's guys like Yoel Romero and Jacques Array was on a tear and they fucking fucked his career up. There's there's certain times where, like, there is a guy, I mean, Tom Aspinall is an interim yeah. champ right now, but he's yeah. now and been the interim champ for a year and has defended it. That um, was sort of what I was going to say is, like, it's it's just it's sort of like you said inherently disrespectful to call somebody the uncrowned champ but it's also to put somebody in a position that somebody has to call them the uncrowned champ is also inherently disrespectful like what john jones is doing to the heavyweight division is disrespectful what like what has been going on with the welterweight division since like bj penn was around like is not is not the most respectful to the next guy up it's it's the same thing reoccurring in every single division yeah, no, definitely. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers the question. It's not something I've thought about 100%. It's an interesting question. Um, Chester says, uh, I like his instinct to finish even by sub instead of trying to pound him out to get a TKO or prove he doesn't need subs. Agreed. That is a good look, and it's clearly something that is going to set him apart because <laughs> not a lot of guys are switching to a Darce in that position. Yeah. Let's be real. Some guys, there's some guys that definitely will, but Kate is very good. And James says, how did you guys know I was referring to John Jones? <laughs> oh, man. And Omar says, uh, when Oliveira won the belt from Chandler, people already started calling the D- Dustin the uncrowned champ. It was disrespectful to Oliveira, in my opinion. I, that, that is true. Yeah. That did happen. And, yeah. and that's where it falls under. Like, it, it depends on who the champion is. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, you call uh, 
Poirier, the champion over Oliveira, who took the long way to get to that title and didn't talk his way to anything. That's super yeah. disrespectful. But you call Jose Aldo the uncrowned champion after only losing one fight in however long, like just because he only, he had lost that first fight to Max. Like I don't find that disrespectful to Max, and I don't think if you asked Max, he would have found it disrespectful either. True. And the situation with John John Jones, he deserves all the disrespect, so it's all good. Yeah. Yeah, uh, because you you run over a pregnant lady and come back for your money. I'm pretty sure I can disrespect you. It's it is the law. That part is yeah. the law. He also it, he went back to grab weave so that he yeah could, that wouldn't be on the side. The crime yeah, side. and but then hi, hiding and then hiding underneath the 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 the, the, the octagon. No one's going to talk about that. Don't worry about it. Yeah, didn't happen. Yeah, beating up his girlfriend allegedly in front of his kid. Yeah, the list goes on. Yeah, uh, but we can move on to my boy Sam okay. A versus uh, Jean Pemian. Um, and I'm sorry, Rich. I know we're an hour and 20 in. Um, there's only two more, three more fights, including this one that we're going to cover, but this one will be quick. Seven more fights. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just want to give a big shout out to Sam A. Sam A is so fucking cool. Uh, and shout out Caleb. It is the law. Uh, <laughs> it is the law. But Sam A turning back the clock once again, back to back wins now. Uh, he didn't get the knockout in this one. He did last time. Uh, but we keep saying it. His left straight is so goddamn good. And Jean Pemian is a savage. He's a killer. He's an absolute killer. And he's trying to walk him down. And he's eating the knee to the body over and over. Sam A fought this. It was a master class on how to fight somebody who wants to pressure you heavy. Is They're walking you down. Slam your knee into their, their solar plexus or on their belly button in this picture. Uh, but over and over and over again, if they give you a little bit of space, I kick them. Uh, and every time they try to throw a punch, meet him with that that straight left. He throws so well. He was snapping his head back, and he was eating shots, and and taking them well. And I'm like, dude, he's like 40 years old, and he's been in dog fights, hundreds of fights, and he's eating these shots very well. Never even wobbled, never even staggered. And John Pamion hits like a truck, so it's like it's not like he's yeah. just fighting some slouch, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's hard to be. It, it's hard to beat a tie who like. He's 50 years old and still smokes a pack of cigarettes before the fight. You know what I mean? Yeah, dude. And far to put him down. They just can't. If cancer can't put him down, they, you ain't dropping him with that right hand. I'm sorry, buddy. Yeah. And I mean, he just masterclass of distance of footwork. The, the fade away high kick switch. High kick was fucking awesome. He got it over the shoulder. That's so impressive. And then the left hand just kept. I mean, people don't land high kicks from there. That range is very tough to kick someone in the head in. Um, and the left hand is back again. Chummy boy says Sam A in the flow state. Love to see it. Everything he was doing was working. I could not be happier. It's cool to see legends continue have, to have success because it's very rare in combat sports. Usually by the time you're a legend, you're getting knocked out by like random shots that barely touch you. Things like that. Uh, and Chester says it was my feel good fight of the night. Yeah, 100%. Um, but we could move on to another feel good fight for me. My boy, Buchecha. Versus Amir Ali Akbari. Good fight. I thought, I was like, Ramir was pulling up the odds the whole time we were doing the fight companion, and Amir was the the favorite in this one. And I was like, I guess I get it because Bucheta, a jiu-jitsu guy, usually don't have great takedowns. And Amir, or they're strong, or maybe they're watching the the fluffy fight, and they're like, oh, maybe it, it, the same thing will happen. Yeah, and and immediately, well, not immediately, but he gets the takedown early, and I was like, dude, if he can get the takedown early, that's the game changer. Because like Amir is a very good Greco-Roman wrestler, he's very good at those like those clinch positions that a lot of jujitsu ju- ju- guys try to work takedowns from. Greco-Roman wrestling, very good in that position <laughs> to defend those takedowns. And not this one though, not this one. Very different. He didn't <laughs> clinch up and try to hit like a toss or something like that. He actually like shot on him, right? Got the takedown, and there was like three and a half minutes left, and I was like, you know what, dude? I think this is a wrap, dude. You're not going to survive up your back with Puchesha on you with three minutes to work. Um, and uh, yeah, he works through him, passes, keeps passing. Amir turns over, he gives up his back, um, takes the back, gets the rear naked choke, chokes him out. First round submission for Puchesha as the underdog, coming off the rug rug loss. And now he's in a position to fight rug rug again for the belt. All of a sudden, the heavyweight division looks better. And there's like some future and like, something to get excited for and i know he fought out his contract in this fight so maybe we don't see him again in one but selfishly i do really want to see bucecha versus rug rug for the belt 
because the first fight it was crazy it was sloppy it was a heavy it, they gassed but it was crazy transitions and takedowns yeah. and it was wild and I mean, heavyweight fights are not the most technical thing no matter where you watch them True. i mean we, we we give a lot of cadence to to the ufc for like how their top fighters in the in the heavyweight division fight but if you look at anything below top eight they're all doing the same shit dude it's tough it's Outside, tough I would watching say, i would even say like top six like yeah. even some of the people in the top 10 it's it's tough dude yeah. um yeah, Caleb says such a sick pick of that rear naked choke. They've got some great fucking photos. Their photographers are fucking A plus over there in one. They're really great. Um, and Synchro says, why did Thai elitist hate four ounce Muay Thai? Four ounce Muay Thai uh, is really cool. Yes, it might be different, but it's more entertaining. Thoughts? Um, I think part of it isn't necessarily just the four ounce. I think a lot of people, a lot of Muay Thai traditionalists, um, don't like how one uh breaks up the clinch often they break up the clinch pretty often compared to like there's not a lot of clinch work in in muay thai in one um it's also uh there's more damage and a lot of the stuff in in muay thai you have so many fights right and these guys are going out here and they're swinging these four ounce gloves there's less defense because of it and it's not good health wise right so there's i think those are the arguments against it uh oh chummy boy says hard to say wings some arguments uh, I heard that make the most sense is that we might see less technique or less technician fighter because it's more risky to do so with such small gloves if they can't uh, develop the timing down. Um, yeah, the like Moy Femur style, right, isn't as prevalent in one because it's a lot harder to defend uh, in four ounce gloves. You don't have these big yeah. shields on your hands, right? Um, so yeah, there's there's uh, there's if you're a fan of four ounce Muay Thai, I, I would imagine there's a lot of people who are fans of four ounce Muay Thai who have just recently found it that if you showed them traditional Muay Thai, they'd be like, what happened here? What, where's the like crazy exciting fights that I'm used to? And like, I like it. I like it more. I like, I mean, I like fucking all combat sports, right? But for a lot of people, they're going to think that traditional Muay Thai is slow or it's boring and things like that. And then on the flip side, you have traditional Muay Thai guys who are going to dislike this crazy four ounce Muay Thai. And I think it's just, you can't please everybody, right? Uh, I think that's kind of what, I don't know if that makes yeah. any sense. Um, but that's all I got for that question. <laughs> but it's a great question. Uh, and with that, we can move on to a four ounce Muay Thai fight. The last fight we're going to be covering. Thank you, Rich, for holding down the fort. Um, we had uh, Muhammad Yunus Rabah versus my boy Eddie Abasolo, Silky Smooth. Love uh, Eddie. Rabba going, yeah, Rabba going up in weight. If you haven't seen our interview with uh, Eddie on this podcast, um, do so, and you will immediately understand why I'm so biased when I'm talking about this fight. <laughs> because he's fucking awesome. And not just because he's a local guy, but he's a very cool, he's a great guy. He's a yeah, very he's cool a guy. great person. All great time. Great person. With the, when I, I met him at the last... Um, uh, Friday, uh, Fight Night of the Tech, Scott Coker and Melinda's uh, show. I saw him there and I was like, oh shit, there's Eddie. So I started talking to him and he seems genuinely interested to have a conversation with me. I'm like, hey, dude, we'd love to have you on our show. And he's like, dude, hit me up. I'm there. We reach out. We have to reschedule. We have to reschedule on him day of because we're fucking, we don't have our shit together. And he's not, he's so cool about it. And he's like, let's do it this day. And we're like, perfect, let's do it. And he jumps on and he's just so kind and so cool. And he's a fucking savage. So what's Absolute not to like, killer. Right? What's not to like? Uh, on the flip side, Raba, uh, also very skilled. He's very dangerous, clearly. He's got a great team over at Medi's team. Um, uh, and shout out Omar says, fan with uh, Eddie. Uh, great interview you did on and on the Casual MMA podcast. Cool guy. Yeah, he was on the Casual. He, so he, we did the podcast with him, I think, like the day before he went down to LA to do that Casual MMA show. Um, he also did a show on combat sports today. Um, and that was also very good. He's just all around a great guy. Genuinely interested. You see a lot of fighters who talk to, who do a lot of these interviews. Right. And like, you could tell they're like, man, there's another one that I got to do. Yeah. And they'll and, say the same thing over and over. Just give you the same answer. Well, they get the same question a lot too. So yeah, I don't blame him. Right. But Eddie is clearly present engaged, genuinely wants to be there. It seems like just a great guy. Um, James says, are you guys MMA media? Uh, do you guys do interviews often? Um, 
I guess we are, right? We get to go to Denver. If you haven't watched the video yes. we did. Uh, you de- you one... definitely are. Yeah. You definitely you are. <laughs> we got to cover one, 168 in Denver. We got media credentials. Um, you've, and, uh, you've interviewed... You've interviewed Alex Caceres, like, yeah, uh, we've had yeah, some cool you, ones, right? We've had, yeah, we had uh, Toasty on here multiple times. Oh yeah, there's <laughs> that one guy. I know that yeah. guy. Uh, but yeah, we've got some interviews. Uh, we try to do them as often as we can, but we're not good at scheduling. Um, but yeah, subscribe and you'll see more interviews. Um, we have actually a couple of people who are trying to get on. We just need to coordinate. Um, but yeah, as Chester says, Raba is huge. He drops Eddie in the first round uh, with a nice cut. Raba is so long and he fights very well uh, with his length. He, he does that step in knee and then follows it up with a punch after the knee as he's planting that knee that he just threw. And that's dangerous. And you see guys land that step like Armin Star, you can in a high level UFC fight, if you want an example, uh, lands that uh, against uh, Benil Dariush. Very dangerous because you have to address the knee that's coming at your face from a tall fighter. And as soon as you address that and you're like, great, I blocked that. Let's reset. And then there's a fist coming right after it. Dangerous. He drops Eddie in the first round. He's spinning on Eddie. He's landing shots, spinning elbows, body shots, liver shots. Eddie just seems like he couldn't quite get his groove. And he's normally such a he, he's such a fluid fighter, right? So when you get him in his rhythm, it's really hard to touch him. Um, second round, Rob is up in the corner. He spins again, elbows him in the side of the head, drops him. And you're like, fuck. Because like I said, very biased. I like Raba, but I was very biased and I was rooting for Eddie. He spins and hits him. I think it's the next photo um, with the spinning back elbow right there. Uh, drops him. And that's Eddie's move. Eddie's always the one that spins. What a picture, by the way. Yeah, fucking cool, dude. It's really cool. Um, so, yeah, he drops him. And I'm like, fuck, dude. That's, a, that's two 10-8 rounds now. We're down. We need to finish in this third round. And the third round, Raba's slowing down, dude. He's slowing down heavy, and Eddie is still coming at him. And he's landing big shots. He's now slipping shots, and he lands this fucking left hook up against the ropes with 20 seconds left. And he drops him like a sack of potatoes. And it looked like he was like unconscious, like for, for like a, a second. second. Like, he, like he was, I was like, oh my God, he's dead. Yeah. And then he gets up, and you're like, I was like, holy shit, dude, we got to go now. We gotta go now. And they start the they they obviously they bring Eddie to his corner. They do the count, and as soon as they start it, Eddie literally just runs and she, like leaps at him like fucking Wolverine. <laughs> he can leaps at him because there's only like three seconds left. Hits him with the combo. The fight ends. Obviously, Raba gets the decision because he dropped him rounds one and two. But for that moment, those last thirty seconds, that fucking pure excitement. Then there's so many comebacks like that, right? Where you get. Yeah. You get dropped in four ounce Muay Thai. People get dropped all the time. Like there's no shame in getting dropped, right? And the comebacks and all this stuff is there's it's, it's like man, if this was five rounds, and in the streets, Eddie wins that fight. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, you also got to love like Eddie's one of those guys that just like he never like it's one of those things that feeds into like why he's so beloved. It's like he like there wasn't a second in that fight where he gave up on himself. Like even yeah. in those last three seconds, he's like like okay, I only got three seconds. I'm gonna sprint and I'm just gonna like I'm gonna throw what I, I'm gonna throw the kitchen sink and it's if it yeah. hits, it hits. How many times have you seen a guy who there's ten seconds left in the fight and they're down and they need to finish and they just kind of circle because they're tired yeah. or they shoot and you're like that's not gonna get you the win. Yeah, they this just want it to be want. over. Yeah, this is what you want. You want a guy who's going to leap at the guy from across the ring because the, he doesn't have enough time to get there with his footwork. He needs to jump because it's all or nothing in this moment, and he goes for it. You got to respect that. Um, uh, Caleb says a minute longer would have been his. Yeah, even Raba said post-fight, he was like, man, it was a tough fight. It was a long three rounds. He's like, it was tough. And Chummy Boy says Raba still needs to get more punishment for that knee on the floor. Yeah, who was that against? Was that against Semipet? Um, who did he fight? That was against Semipet. Yeah, he drops Semipet. Semipet's on the ground. He knees him in the head, and they end the fight. And you're like, well, that's illegal. And then they just never said anything about it. And then the rematch, they talked about it then. Then he beat him. Um, Ryo says, uh, is it hard to be unbiased if you have interviewed someone? Do you think it's important to be unbiased for an analytical eye? Yeah, I. it is very difficult. It's extremely difficult, actually. Um, it also makes watching fights more difficult. Like, dude, watching your fights, it's tough. It's difficult. Even like when you're winning, even like, 
you won the amateur belt in A1 combat. The first ever amateur belt you won by finish. But the whole fight, I was like, ah, it's fucking hard. It's difficult because you care about somebody, right? And you're, they're getting punched in the face. So it's difficult. Um, and it's As a fighter, if I'm, if I'm watching the fight, like, I understand people have biases. I, I, I don't think it's important to not have biases. I think it's important to e- express those biases, like, off the rip. Like there's times when like Paul Felder will be commentating and um, like, he'll be like, Oh, I've like the, almost one of the first thing he says is like, Oh, I used to train with this guy. I I've sparred with him or like, he'll mention that he knows his coach or whatever. And it kind of gives you an idea. Okay. Like if he says something, you know why he's saying it. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. I think that, and that's why I started this when we switched to this fight, I was like, oh, this is why I'm biased in this fight. And you're about to hear me be biased. Um, so it's it's difficult not it's almost impossible when we first started this and we started interviewing people i was like i need to make sure that i stay unbiased for the integrity of the show and then quickly learned it's actually impossible Um, yeah it's literally impossible yeah and as long as you address it and you can keep that um you can keep that as one side of your mind and not let it blind you to certain things that are happening i think that's ultimately all that matters yeah, you just gotta um, be honest with yourself. Is all it comes down to. I mean, that yeah. same that same thing you were talking about that video where I won the the amateur title at A one. The Corey McKenna, who was doing the commentary for that fight, has become mm-hmm. like a personal friend of mine. She literally painted the mural on the side of our building like last week. Oh, so it's like, you really think she's gonna be like super unbiased the next time she watches me fight? I don't think so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and Chummy Boy says you can have bias, but we need to acknowledge what really happened in the ring. A hundred percent. Yeah, and like yeah. I said. First two rounds, Eddie was struggling to get his momentum, to get his rhythm, and that is because of Raba. It's directly, I mean, maybe there's outside factors. He flew, flew all the way from California to Thailand for this fight. Raba made a trip too. Um, that being said, Raba was firing on all cylinders to start this fight, and he's very good. He's very good. Um, I mean, some of the work he was doing, the spins were fantastic. The, the liver shots were fantastic. The, the step-up knee, very good work from Raba. Um, it just uh, is my boy. So you got to talk about the. Yeah. the I mean, we did a fight companion, and uh, I legitimately spazzed out when when Eddie dropped him in the third round with twenty seconds left. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> somebody put it, put it on the page. I have a, I have a clip of it. I don't, I'm gonna send it to him before I post it. Just be like, hey, this is cool. But uh, those should start. Those should be like your guys' shorts on YouTube. The reactions to stuff That's yeah we're yeah about. we're trying to figure it out but yeah uh that is the last fight we're going to talk about we did an hour and 40 minutes um shout out to Love Ayaka Mira. got the scarf hold uh got the ayaka lock um and her fight oh, that was a gruesome arm that arm looked oh, so disgusting nasty yeah i love yeah. a specialist um and she, she's a specialist at that uh but yeah shout out to uh everybody who jumped in the chat and <laughs> genevieve says joe and i left off the couch i'm assuming that's from the uh the Eddie knockdown because we're all rooting for him. Uh, and I mean that with no disrespect for Raba. Uh, bonuses we had Ayaka Mira got one for her Ayaka lock. Uh, Marcus Buchecha Almeida uh, got one for his submission first round. And then Cade Rotolo got one as well. Uh, James says, Great show. Rao says, This was fun. Synchro says, Chat was popping tonight. Yeah, we appreciate all you guys because literally the chat makes the show so much better. When it's just us talking, we're going to say everything that we say, but then people will ask a question that we didn't even think of. And then now we can talk about that. And it's an interesting thing. Like we had some great questions in there. So yeah, appreciate the chat. Thank you everybody for joining synchro, Ryo, James, Genevieve, Blunderbub, Chummy Boy, Caleb, uh, Ryo, James, not Romero, Omar, Romero never showed up. That's okay. He's there for other people, not us. Uh, probably people more important though. Um, Ganscow, ghost, uh, Jack Slack timestamps. Uh, I mean, just, we had a lot of people and I appreciate that. Um, it definitely makes the, fu- the show a lot more fun. We normally do the show on Sundays. Uh, next week, um, I think, is UFC 309. Is it? Should be Madison, right? Madison Square Garden, John Jones, Stipe. It is. Yes. Uh, we got John Jones, Stipe for God knows what reasons. We have Del Bronx versus Michael Chandler, Bo Nickel versus Paul Craig, Karina Silva versus Arujao. Rufi is back against Yontop. Martinez is back against my boy Marcus McGee. Chris Weidman versus Eric Anders. It's not a great card. <laughs> uh, but it is all the East Coast people. 
Yeah. We'll see what happens here. Uh, Caleb says, what a traitor, Romero. I know. Who chooses their family over their uh, podcast? <laughs> that's, that's why I don't have family. What a traitor. <laughs> uh, raise the, Rich says, raise the cat, bitch. Uh, toasty. Oh, uh, hold on. Oh, he's got to go get it. Uh, Caleb says, who do I got in the Jones fight? I got Jones. I think Stipe has been out for far too long, and he's a little bit too aged. We got the cat back on screen. <laughs> All right, Toasty, thank you for joining in on short notice. What are we plugging at Toasty MMA? Yeah, I got I got nothing going on right now. Um, the I just started uh, coaching at the high school here in town, so if you guys want to give a follow to the kids' Hey everybody, Romero and Will here. Thank you so much for watching that short clip. It's just a small clip of what we covered this last Sunday. Yeah, if you want to check out the full fight card recap, uh, the link is in the description and it's going to be on screen at the end here. Uh, don't forget to go back and watch our fighter interviews that we have. Uh, and don't forget to tune in live every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern, uh, and you can join in on the fun. Yeah, don't forget to like, subscribe, Hit the notification bell, goes a long way. All right, everybody, thanks for watching that short clip from Story of the Fight.